Namaskar. Uh, good morning. We have two sessions today, and uh, I just like to say a few things about what, what I thought I'll speak about in the morning session and then in the afternoon session. In the morning session, uh, I thought we'd discuss the tradition that I come from, Carnatic music, and the practice of it, its present practice, and where it has come from, and possibly the questions that need to be asked about its practice. So the morning session will be, shall we say, concentrating on the music itself. The afternoon session, uh, since it's a question that has been asked of me many times, of why should a musician be part of a public space? Why should a musician be engaged in anything that is part of society? Your job is to sing, your job is to make music, just make music. Your, your story of society is through your music. Your response to society is through your music. So why do you have to look at that? So the afternoon session I talked about, I'll talk about the line between the private and the public in an artist. And whether there is a line, and if there is, how definite is it? How much does it move? And how much do each, the public and the private, come together in so many things? The music that you sing and the way you deal with your life. So, the morning session will be more related to Carnatic music itself in the sense of its practice. So I just want to say a few words about where I am coming from. In the last uh, about a decade, I started singing Carnatic music when I was, shall we say, I started coming on stage when I was 12 years old, which was 1988. And, uh, I sang like anybody else and performed through the 90s. And it's only from about, say, 2000, 2001, did I really start thinking, I think, about what I was doing and about the practice itself. And in the last 10 years, I have felt compelled, shall I say, to question a lot of practices that I have done. A lot of things that I do musically, I have been forced to ask myself whether it is musical at all. Is it the music at all? Is a question that I have asked myself. And whatever I'm going to speak today comes from that whole process, which is not over, which is still happening. But the whole idea of what is this music? Where do I come from? Why am I singing it? And where is it going? I think these are the questions that overall define what I'm going to talk about today. The moment I say Carnatic music, I'm sure in all your minds there will be a lot of words that appear. Can you try and tell me what words come if I say Carnatic music? Classical. Classical? Sorry? South Indian? Okay. Anything else? Mathematics. Mathematics. Interesting. Tradition? Sorry? Purukhar Das. Sorry? Territory. Territory. It's a territory. Okay, territorial. Tiagaraja. Yeah. Yeah. Alapana. 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 Science. Vadiyakara. Science. Very interesting. Rigidity. Fabulous. <laughs> Anything else? Anything else? Anything else that comes to it? Bani. Sorry? Bani. 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 Okay. Brahmanical. Okay. Brahmanical territorial probably all go together. <laughs> Conventional. <laughs> Sorry? Narasar. <laughs> Anything else? Associated with Bharatanakya. Associated with Okay. Devotion. Devotion. Thank you. I was hoping somebody will say it. I'm glad you did. Uh, anything else? Ridiculous system. Sorry? Ridiculous system. Gurukula. like a ridiculous system. So I didn't mind. <laughs> okay. Gurukula system. Fine. Anything else? Carnatic music. Images. What are the images that you have? Snobbish. Snobbish. Nadarga. Fabulous. I think we have pretty much put Karnali music into a fabulous box. You know, we have defined it pretty much. Anybody else? Jatis. Jatis. I'm going to stop it here because we're going to specifics now. <laughs> Sorry? Sorry, silk size. Oh. I, I think she kind of said it when he said primary. So. <laughs> 
So, yes. So if you say Carnatic music, now the fine thing is I'm a practitioner, okay? And if I say Carnatic music, or even if I just think of that word, actually the first feeling that comes in me is fear. You know, certain, suddenly I'm nervous. Say Carnatic music, even as a practitioner who has been doing this from when I was 12 years old, and I say fear, you know, you know, in a very interesting sense, it's like almost like there is suddenly some burden on my shoulder. Suddenly I feel that I belong to about 300 years or 500 years or 700 years before. Something so old. I have this image of this, shall we say, no electricity time when everybody, you know, this whole image of art being free in society and everybody exchanging art like, it was, you know, this whole illusion that we have of what art was in society. I have this whole feeling and I have this feeling that I am somehow seeing that music. You know, I'm seeing music that is so holy, so traditional, so full of religiosity, bhakti, you know, antiquated. And I also feel it's very complex. Somebody said mathematics. So, uh, when he said mathematics, the idea of complexity automatically comes to it, you know. Sophisticated. And first, it's very Hindu music. Carnatic music is very Hindu music. Because we think about Rama, Krishna, Govinda, Kamakshi, Meenakshi, Lakshmi, everybody else. So, the moment, even as a practitioner, I say this, I almost feel a burden. The truth is there is a certain burden. This is my personal <laughs> expression. This is my personal expression. And I call it a burden, not because it's religious, so not because it's old, but because I feel somehow, though I live in 2014, when I sing this music, I am transporting myself and all of you to a world which is thousand years past. And if I don't provide you that experience, then in some way, I have been, shall we say, wrong to the music. I have failed the music. Somewhere the music is somehow, I have not done, I have not enriched your life. You know, this is, this is how I feel. So, what is this responsibility? What is the responsibility I feel? And the moment I say that, I always like to go with the images that come with me when I say something because that kind of guides me in the way I think. The first name that comes in capital letters is Tyagaraj. Not Kurodhavadasa, sorry. It's Tyagaraj. Now he's like the biggest icon. You know, I think of Tyagaraj, I think of Samadhi. I think of Samadhi, I think of all the musicians sitting there and singing Andhra Mahama Bhavi every year. Okay? So, I have this image, I see, I see the Aarti, I see Tyagaraja as the icon of what Carnatic music spirit is. In spirit, Carnatic music is Tyagaraja. In terms of what his iconic status is, is not just as a musician, but as somebody who symbolizes the spirit of the art itself. So, I think of sainthood. So, these are the images, these are the thoughts, these are what come to my head. Now when I say this, I have to ask myself, what am I singing? What am I singing? What do I represent? So when I sing, is there anything that I am doing? Or is there something that I am just replicating in order to just survive in this, this whole environment that has been happening for 2000? How many years we believe this happening? And you would instinctively think there is something Advaitic about this, that there is no I. That all musicians in some way, are only, shall we say, channels to the, to the greatness of the past. So in a way, when a musician sings, the musician is only being a conduit, a little channel, a little pathway to something of the past. And there is no I to it. This Advaitic unison with music, with raga, with tala, with, with whatever. You know, I think that's the biggest lie. Because I think the I is actually very overt in Carnatic music. It's there at your face. But the I is beautifully wed into this construction we call tradition. This I is completely immersed in that construction. So what actually happens? So what is this tradition? It goes back to the ritualism. It goes back to the Brahmanism. It goes back to a hold by a group of people. It goes back to the, to the whole sainthood. And I as a musician am placing myself in that very, very hallowed sphere, which means you are not my equal. None of you in the auditorium who listen to my music is my equal. I am far above you. Because only because of me, you have a connectivity to what is intangible. 
So the eye is actually very, very overt. The eye is very present in the musician. The musician is very aware that he is in some way connecting to this divinity, this intangible. And he is also aware that you need him for that connection. He believes so at least. So this belief that the musician is some way not in, in the Carnatic tradition or in the Indian tradition itself is some way not there visibly, I think is a bit of a lie. I think it is there. I'll give a few funny examples. There have been cases where musicians during the concert have, been, have a distributed kumkum. I'm not going to exaggerate. During the concert, suddenly the vocalist will pick up kumkum and give it to the Mridang player. Some more to the, to the violinist. If a singer wears a panchakacha and comes to a concert with a lot of vipuli, I can tell you that concert will be divine. There is no other option. It is divine. It is, the person doesn't matter what the person sings. The person is dressed like the typical person, typical Brahmin who is going to do his puja. And he comes and sits on stage. And by placing himself like that, he is placing himself in a position of power. And I have purposely consciously used the word he because this is also part of the identity of the man. And this system is also part of the identity. So, I am actually extremely egoistic about the fact that I represent something that I am delivering you. It's almost a deliverance, almost something I'm gifting you as an audience. But then, there is a little problem there. You ask any classical musician, Carnatic musician, suppose I won't tell him, my goodness, that was so innovative, that was so different. And the musician said, no, 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 I didn't do anything. Immediately they tell that. I didn't do anything. Everything has been done in the past. I have done nothing. I have only carried forward what they have given me. So in a way, the person will give you an image that they have actually contributed nothing, which is actually a lie. The system itself means every individual artist is actually doing something to the music every time the person sings. But no Carnatic musician will openly, the traditional type, will accept that they have actually done something different. They will keep telling you, no, this is something my guru taught me. The Guru Kola system, my guru did it so many years ago. I am only continuing that tradition that the guru gave me. Is what they will tell you. Because the word innovation is problematic. For a Carnatic musician, the moment you use the word innovation, he thinks of it being something against tradition. Those two words are placed at two poles. That innovation and tradition are not together. So if you say innovation, the person thinks he's breaking something of the past. He's actually ruining something of the past. If you say he's traditional, then he feels that he's somebody who's, who's like the basket that is holding everything of the past. But that's a, there is a big irony to this, which I will come to, that the innovation is seen as a word of science and tradition is seen as a word of art. But the irony here is what you see as Carnatic music today is actually, and I would say unfortunately, the construction of that very similar scientific theorization that we don't want to be associated with. And I'll come back to that after a point of time. The irony is though we dissociate with it, everything that you hear as Carnatic music today, rather shall I say most of it, is actually a result of that same science, which we don't see. So, you have I being so surreptitiously played into the narrative of Carnatic music, and you have this whole bhakti, you have this disassociation association with science, with anything that is considered anti-tradition. You have this idea that change is something that can happen but we will not talk about it. We will only talk about it as being something of the past. So we all live in Carnatic music, in this whole environment. This is the environment in which this music is being practiced even today. It will today and probably will be in the future. But then I have to ask the next question, what is this I really know about this music? I mean, if I'm so sure that this music is like this, it's of this past, it was this, this tradition that is so many hundreds of years ago, do I, how much do I really know about it? And there is the most fascinating part. I really don't know much. And I'll tell you why. Most of the music that you hear as Carnatic music today, 
is when I say converting is pretty, I mean in terms of performance, in terms of concept, whatever. Is pretty much a construction of late 19th century, maybe even earlier, say 19th century and 20th century. It is actually a construction that happened over the last 150 years. What you hear is Carnatic music, in which there were many characters who played a role. And I'll, I'll go to a few of those characters. One very important character are the Haritha Vidwans who migrated to Tanjore during the times of the Marathas in Tanjore. Now, there were a lot of, there were, there were two traditions, Marathi traditions, and they migrated to Tanjore and they, they started this whole idea of Hari Katha, Katha of Hari, where they used to tell stories of the Lord and also sing along with those stories. Now there is some scholars who believe that they may have even come in the 16th, 17th century, but I do feel that their impact is more seen only in the 18th century, so I will stick, sorry, to the 19th century, so I will stick to that. Now they brought with them art, Mridanga playing techniques, musical ideas from Marathi speaking regions. They brought it to Tanjore. And Tanjore was already then a basket of lot of art. There were Drupadiyas coming there, there were Khyal singers coming there, there was local traditions there, Tyagaraja was from there, Dikshikar was from there, Shama Shastri was from there, their Shishyas were there. So there was this whole basket of things that were happening artistically. A lot of exchange. A very important thing that you need to note here is that it was more profitable to be a Harikata Vidwan than to be a Carnatic musician. So most people, most musicians doubled up. So in the late 19th century, you had a so-called Carnatic musician, I'm just using it as a term, singing Harikata one day and next day doing what would be called a Carnatic concert. The same person. You had the Mridanga players who played for Harikata also playing for the concerts. So you can naturally see that a lot of movement was happening. One of the biggest impacts of the Harikata Vidwans, the biggest impact is the Kirtana, the compositions coming on to the concert stage. It was practically because of the influence of the Harikata Vidwans that you have so many Kirtanas being sung in Karnati music today. Before that they sang a lot of Alapanas, sang one line compositions, we call them Pallavis. And they sang a lot of Tana, which is more improvisational. And it was because these Harikata Vidwans realized that these compositions were also part of a narrative. Now, for example, he used to say a Rama story, and then he'll bring a Tyagaraja Kirtana into it. Rama, Bhakti, Rama, I don't know the way to Bhakti. So Tyagaraja Kirtana became popular because of their entry into Harikata and not because of Karnatic Kachis. The moment they entered there, these people were also singing so-called concerts. The next day, they borrowed it from there and brought it into the classical Carnatic narrative. The moment they did that, composition started loading the idea of what you see modernly as a kachemi, as a concert. A lot of composition. In fact, if people sang two less compositions today in a Carnatic concert, people will say, what, the concert dragged. It was boring. It was slow. These are all the natural reactions. But this happened only because of Harikata, which is very interesting. The another important point where Tyagaraja becomes such an important character is most of the Shishyas of Tyagarajas were also Harikata Vidwans, which is why Tyagaraja Kirtanas became more popular than any other Kirtan. Sometimes they used these compositions even if there was no context to bring in music. So Tyagaraja Kirtanas became so famous because his disciples were doing Harikata making their living through Harikata and singing his compositions always. So he became the icon and his compositions even till date in a Carnatic concert, the maximum number of compositions will usually be of Tyagaraja. If you don't sing a Tyagaraja composition, people will point out and tell you why you sing a Tyagaraja composition. That's the level of influence that he got. The other thing which I will refer to again later is the whole idea of Madras then now Chennai, becoming the center of pretty much most movements in the south. A certain urbanization started happening. And the whole story of Carnatic music went on its head the moment that started happening. And I'll refer to that again. At the same time, we also had this great nationalism 
that was our love swing, which also influenced what kind of music was fit for Carnatic music, what lyrics were fit for Carnatic music, what story is Carnatic music saying, which also is part of what you could call the grammarization of Carnatic music also. So these broadly, it's very interesting, you know, uh, I know many of you know that Gandhi himself referred to the charka as a, somewhere as a music of the charka. And I will tell you, a lot of Carnatic musicians till the 60s wore only khali. They were very proud of wearing khali. Carnatic musicians sang for the entire movement. D.K. Pratamal sang the composition of Subramani Bharati. M.S. Subhulakshmi was part of the musical narrative of the national. So all this was part of creating a certain antiquity, a certain purity, a certain self-worth, in a certain Hindu nationalism that was part of what Carnatic music became. And so what you hear as Carnatic music is actually, shall we say, to a large extent, a 20th, 19th, 20th century creation art form. Its source is very much older, which I will come to. But what you hear as a concept is this. And this is the point that I have aesthetically argued in, my, in the way I have interpreted the music and in my questions to the music. Whether this movement in some way has affected the music itself or shall we say a certain essence of the music itself. This is the primary question. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Oh, I really understand. Thank you very much. I'm going to just make a little jump over here. I've just given you a little background. I'm going to make a jump to my generation of musicians, the ones who came about in the 90s, mainly in the 90s. And if I was going to say what is the what are the criticisms that the musicians of the 90s and the and the new millennium actually receive? I'm reminded of a letter of, a, of an article which was written in the late 90s in the Hindu to which I actually responded. And it was written, it was a scathing article about the lifestyle of the modern musician. And I still remember the points raised by the writer. He said this, Carnatic musicians today have secretaries. They have become detached. You can't even talk to them. They are all after money. They charge a lot of money, they are all after money. They drive around in fancy, luxurious cars, and this is 1999. I don't know how many luxury cars were there in India, but 1999 nevertheless. Fancy cars. Then there is no connection between them and the rasikas and the audience. There is, there is a disconnect. Now, these were the criticisms levied upon all of us by this gentleman. And I found it very, very interesting that all he could say about the musicians of the 90s was this. Uh, I would give you more criticism than this, but so and then so basically, if you go into the inner sense of what he was saying, he was actually saying that there was irreverence in these people. He was saying that we were not humble enough. He was saying that unlike the musicians of the 1940s, who I will come back, who I again have to refer to very importantly, we don't have that engagement with the audience. We detach ourselves almost like superstars. So he was basically saying that we lacked bhakti. He said we lack bhakti. We lack humility. We lack all the qualities that we usually draw from the textual meanings of many compositions. And he said we lack all that. And therefore, this is not the way Carnatic music should go. And musically, what was the criticism? There were musically only two or three. They were not, and we are not as hardworking as the musicians of the past. We don't have the rigor. We don't engage in the bhava, in the in the bhava of the meanings. We don't transport the audience to a status of bliss where they are one with the Lord. So this are other musical criticism that were being thrown at us. Now this 1940s, 1950s, which is very commonly known as the golden era of Carnatic music. Most people use that term. Um, is very interesting. I actually think that it's a very important period of Carnatic music because the musicians of the 30s and the 40s 
I see her like almost like entrepreneurs, like businessmen. Because that was the first time that you had a culture of ticketing here, you know. People had sabhas, people bought tickets. So these people were new businessmen. All these great musicians were great new businessmen. And there was a new market. The market was a ticketed audience. It was not just a temple, it was not just a private gathering. So you had to, in a way, they, at least I think they thought, you had to sell this to the audience because now they are paying money and sitting there. If they are paying money and sitting there, how do I hold their attention for two hours or four hours? How do I sell this music to them? So they actually marketed Carnatic music better than anybody else ever has. They marketed it brilliantly. And because they market it so well, by the way, we call it the golden era. It's actually the marketing is why we call it the golden era. I am in no way, I will say this, making a comment on the musical quality of those musicians. I am not commenting on that. I am commenting on what they actually did that gave you a certain impression. Because they really took this music beyond just being in the temple where people would pay tickets. People were buying tickets to buy listen to Carnatic, which is very rare. It's the first time. So they were great, great individuals who really pushed the pedal as far as the modern Carnatic music is concerned. Which is why we keep calling them the golden era. And it's very interesting. Any musician who has had association with one musician of the golden era is still considered part of the golden era. The generation next, which did not have any connection with one musician of the golden era, is damned. There's a clear dividing line. So if you see, if you say my guru was learning in the 1950s, then some way I am secure. Slightly more secure. If I say I am learning only from somebody from the 70s and 80s, my student learning from me, you can forget about it. You can just forget about it. He's, he's a creation of, uh, of a complete modern English speaking anglicized urban man who has no idea of tradition and bhakti. This, though people don't articulate it this way, this imagery is constantly playing in their heads. It's played in our own heads when we meet people and talk to people. The way we interact with people, we do it, I do it myself. So I can imagine other people do it. So, so this whole 40s, all this is there. But this is what I'm going to place my contention over here. That this whole problem that people see in Carnatic music of it not being rigorous enough, people are you know, not having so much bhakti or not having so much reverence, humility, is actually an extremely superficial understanding of the real problems of the music. I believe that Carnatic music has very serious problems in which I will try and very sing a bit also and talk a bit to try and specify the problems that I'm trying to highlight. I think the idea of aesthetics is where the problem of Carnatic music is to be. And I want to use aesthetics not as a casual term, but as a specific term. Because we use it very casually, I'm always very nervous to use that word. Uh, because it's, it's used so easily. And here I'm talking about aesthetics as being something about form, something about structure, something about its history, something about a psychological habituation also or within a cultural basket. But built into all this is also the intent behind which the art form itself survives. Aesthetics is not just about a structural understanding or about a form understanding. The form exists because there is an intent of what the music is trying to do, what the music is trying to convey. And I would like to use aesthetics in that form, that sense. And I believe there is a serious problem of aesthetics in Carnatic music. And which primarily has been lost in the 19th and 20th century narrative of Carnatic music. And I think it needs revisiting and a serious understanding. You know, when we keep talking about classical music, there is this uh, a recent event where somebody, I mean I was given an award, and somebody read out the reasons why I was given an award. And one reason was very interesting. I was very tempted to respond that day, but I was supposed to be well behaved. So I did not. Uh, but I found it a fascinating construction. They said, innovation, somebody who has done innovation, but within the framework. 
Now, this was the construction, one of the criteria why I was given the award, by the way. And it disturbed me tremendously. When it was read out, it actually bothered me. Because I knew the word framework was being used very loosely, you know, very, very easily. And I knew the word innovation was also being used very loosely. So, when we say Carnatic music or classical music, we think of one framework. We think of one boundary. We think of some rules and regulations. It's almost like you're reading some, again, a mathematics table or something, you know. This you can do, that you can't do, this you can do, this you cannot do. Within that, you have to find yourself, find the music. You know, sometimes you wonder whether this is impossible. Right? So, we have to revisit this idea of framework. We think change, expression, and any movement is within a framework. And I'd say okay to that. But what is this frame? What is this framework that we are talking about? Do we even know what this framework is? Actually, when we all say framework today, you know what we are talking about? We are talking about a concert experience. That's all we are talking about. When you say somebody should do everything within a framework, you mean when I go to a concert and I listen to the concert, I must go come back to the same feeling that I have had in a concert for the last 30 years. <laughs> if I go back to the same feeling, and even if he has done something, shall we say, off, but if he gives me the same feeling of what a concert is, then everything is happy to read. Everything is happy, everybody is happy, because I can still feel secure in what I am used to, which is this framework. So the framework actually is a scary term to use because it is just a habituated experience of a concert. That's all it is actually in its very, very simple sense. This is what I have questioned and I would like to question. And here I'm going to go a little bit of musical history, some musicology if you don't mind, because it's part of this problem. It is important before I do that to understand that the reference to the framework is built into the 20th century performance and that the socio-political movements of the 20th century are part of what you see as a concept and are part of what you experience as a concept are part of what your, what your teachers tell you, what your mother tells you, what your father tells you as what you should experience in Carnatic music and it is part of this authenticity, this kind of a sanctity that we are all seeking in Carnatic music, that we are bound by, which is again part of the format. The format is built so beautifully that the format has its own narrative. Everything that we look for in terms of sanctity, in terms of purity, in terms of religiosity, in terms of ritual. Carnatic music is ritualistic also, which we forget. It's a very ritual form of music. All that is built into the experience of Carnatic music. And we don't even realize that we are actually, we are actually interrogating that when we are talking about this. I'm going to go to a little bit of history here. And a little bit of theory, I hope you don't mind, but I just thought going a little technical is also not too bad, but I will try and explain it in as simple terms as I can. If, you know, the one book that every Indian art form thinks it's associated with it some way or other is Nati Shastra. Any art form you ask him, he'll say Bharata said this. That's the biggest lie we have been living with for the last I don't know how many years. I would say almost for the last 800, 900 years we've lived with this lie. It's an absolute lie. I wouldn't cap to letters. Anybody tells you it's not, I'm going to argue that. Because I want to put Bharata in context first. The Nati Shastra or the Tattilam, which uh, Mukundak has beautifully argued as being older than the Nati Shastra itself, are part of a musical artistic tradition that, were, that flourished until, shall we say, at least the 7th century AD. Okay? It was musically, I will tell you, it is very different from what you sense as Indian classical music. I'll give you a simple example. Again, the example is done very simply, so uh, don't take it literally, but just, just to understand. Now, if you listen to Carnatic music or Hindustan music, you have I think this is simple. Sa is taken as the tonic or the shruti. Okay. 
Now this idea does not ex exist in this terms in Western classical music. You could have a Beethoven symphony where there is actually no fixed tonics uh, that is placing the word symphony. It will keep moving. Can you imagine an Indian classical system which did not have a fixed tonic? That is Bharata Fidi. So, there was no sa, every sa, every raga starting on sa. The word raga doesn't appear in a technical sense at all in Nati Shastra. He doesn't use raga at all. He has only murchanas and jatis. And jatis are not precursors to ragas as we love to say. They are not. They are a very different idea. So you have a musical system which I think was brilliant, complex, complete by itself, which had ideas of music which were borrowed later by many other systems in different regions. So, is Carnatic music connected Bharata? No. Are there seeds of ideas that are being borrowed? Yes. But there are also problems that are being borrowed. So, to say that we are, everything goes to Bharata is actually wrong. It's absolutely wrong. We should stop doing that. Then you have, of course, the music of the Deshi. We call it Deshi, Matanga, Bhir Deshi. Another big document that every person will immediately refer to, 12th century Sangeet Ratnakara. You know, Sarai Deva has given us everything in music. Again, a big line. Yes, it's a fabulous treatise. The Sangeet Ratnakara is a fabulous treatise. But it is not the music that you and I have listened to for the last 200 years. The, the Sangeet Ratnakara is very important because it is almost at a transition point. Secondly, we are not certain about the geography of many of these treatises. Some people say the Nati Shastra was written in the south. Scholars argue the opposite that was written somewhere in Kashmir. The, the commentary of the Nati Shastra by Abhinava, who is a scholar from Kashmir, that we know, which was written about, I think, the 9th or 10th century. But another very important thing that always happened with history is whenever, when Abhinava wrote a commentary on the Nati Shastra, if we were going to say the Nati Shastra was approximately 2nd century AD, for argument, it was about 700 years later. And in his commentary is also ingrained the practice of his times. He was reinterpreting Bharata on the basis of the music that also existed when he was alive. So he is not taking you to Bharata, but he is bringing Bharata to him. That we should understand. We have lost that plot. We are going backwards, but he didn't go, he was bringing Bharata contextual to his times. Because Bharata was the greatest aesthetic character that we could have in this subcontinent. The same thing continued. And in the 12th century, when you have the Sangeeta Pranakara and a few more treatises, you clearly find a different kind of music evolving. You find for the first time the idea of music being independent completely of Natya as in theatre, evolving from around the 12th century. But there is something I want to make an observation here, I have not understood why, but I found it very interesting, that if you read treatises until about the 12th century, the way they perceive art, music, dance, drama, is very different from music treatises post 12th century. Post 12th century, all the treatises become almost like grammar books. It's like a grammar book. This raga has this for us, this raga comes from here, this is how it is, this is how it's allocated, this is the system, this is the tables. Mainly that way. Until Sangeeta Trakara, it's almost an aesthetic idea of life. It's an interpretation of life. It's an interpretation of how life and art are actually in conversation with each other. That somehow disappears. But the tragedy of all, I think, scholarship, unfortunately, is that until the 20th century, we still try to understand our music on the basis of Bharata or on the basis of Sangeeta Bhaka. <coughs> because of which, there have been terminologies that have been reinterpreted, but every scholar has sought a linear connection. There have been forms that have changed. I'll give you an example. There's a word called Tana. Okay? Those who know Carnatic music have heard of Tanam saying. I'll just sing a bit. Okay, this is a kind of 
rhythmic but not structured improvisation. The same word Tana is found in the Nadi Shastra. It's also found in the Sangeeta Prakar. It's found in all those three texts. But the idea of Tana there is completely different. The context is different, the meaning is different, the usage is different from Tana used now. But scholarship has unfortunately drawn one single line back and said Tana came from Nadi Shastra. Tana did not come from Nadi Shastra. It was a very local phenomena that came from influences from maybe even Malayalam speaking regions, Telugu speaking regions, and a huge influence from Kannada speaking regions. The Dasakuta have a very big role to play in all these formulations. But we have not done this scholarship has caused a problem. So here, wherever they started talking about ragas in the 14th, 15th century, they again thought about thought about ragas in a sense of the past. But one fascinating thing happened much before, well, I don't know whether it coincides with the colonial time, it's actually really before the colonial time, which I want to talk about because I find that very influential to the way we see Carnatic music. And here I'm going to talk about ragas, a little technical, bear with me. Can anybody tell you what a raga is? You've all heard the word. Even if you don't know music, you've heard the word raga. It could have escaped you. What is a raga? Sorry? Melody. Arrangement of Swara. Thank you very much for saying that. Anything else? Sequence of words. Connection of ideas. Okay. But what connects the ideas? No, in the sense that how does one form? If you say connection of ideas, there is a certain set of connection of ideas that you call tag as a lot. So what is it that connects them in Pazunga? Because otherwise, there is no reason to call it that, right? <coughs> Emotion, interesting, anything else? The set of swaras which have a specific limitation and possibilities. Set of swaras that have spe specific limitation and possibilities. Okay, anything else? Expression. Expression, that's too vague. <laughs> anything can be expression. Why should only rather be expression? I don't understand. <coughs> mm, I'm not going to buy that part. Anything else? Modulation of sound within a structure. Structure determined by? And So I'm going to be talking about the swaras. Okay. Now we understand there are sapta swaras. The arrangement of sapta, sapta swara, the combination of it. So basically, permutation, combination of sound swaras, what you're saying. Similar to something somebody else said. Maybe with emotion. Maybe with emotion. Thank you. I'm glad you think that is possible. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just joking. Don't take me seriously, please. <laughs> Anything else? Characterization of emotions. Characterization of? Emotion. Of emotion. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a few of these ideas uh, because I think they are the ones that you all believe in. Set of swaras, permutation and combination of swaras, uh, sequence of notes. Now, all of this, I'm just going to now talk a little history for you to just re-look at that idea, okay? Now, until, shall we say, the first Kita, we call it the Mela period, okay? This is what is, musicologically, it's called the Mela period. The first Kita is, is about uh, the 15th century, 16th, 15th century. And that's the first time you find ragas being classified, okay? Now, the word Mela, uh, in Tamil, we use this word, I know they use it in Gatti Mela. Use a Gatti Mela, right? So in the wedding, there's Gatti Mela. So Mela is actually only a grouping. Okay? Grouping of something. In a wedding, it's a grouping, it's, it's, it could be so many things. So this idea of grouping ragas came to be. But what were these ragas? These ragas were not defined by permutation combinations. Okay? These, these ragas were webbed together in terms of phrases. Now, so what happened is, it could be a really simple tunes, melodies that were sung, that were later put together. Now, an easy way to explain to you this is this. All of you have listened to cinema music. Everybody listens to film music. You sometimes listen to one song, and then you listen to another song, and then you say both songs are the same. Why do you say that? 
So I'm going to take a cold raga. Okay? Raga for Begada. Now, no way with the sequence of any sequence of notes that I give Begada, complete the picture of Begada. Because it's a lot of movements. And if I have to know Begada, I have to really know the raga through compositions and songs and just sing it. Little bit of alapana of Begada. What am I thinking when I'm saying? Am I thinking notes? No. I'm only getting phrases. Happens to the identity of the older raga. 
you lose its organic identity. You lose its flavor. All these are happening in Carnatic music today. Happening today, but of course not part of the conversation. So, the music that you call Carnatic music, with its seeds, with its sources, gets about 500 years old, which is true of Hindustani music also, about 500 years. And we have to aesthetically accept this truth. And we also have to see through a lot of other things. There's another parallel narrative. This Raga was an example for you to, for me to show you what happens. Another very interesting thing, and this is something that happened recently in interaction. So a little boy, there was interaction with, with an audience, and this eight-year-old boy came to me and asked me, asked me a very, very, uh, I thought a very interesting question. It was actually about something I do. He said, sir, when you sing, you never put tal, he asked me. He said, you never put tal, but everything comes to tal. You know, those who don't know the Carnatic tradition, in Carnatic tradition, you put the tal, okay? Okay? He said, when you sing, you don't put it, but you don't seem to have a problem with it. How do you do it? It's a very interesting question and actually it's interesting because it kind of gave me an indication of how we perceive the Tal and how we all perceive the Tal. You know how we perceive the Tal? We perceive a Tala as an established construction into which we sing a composition. Correct? Am I wrong if I say this? Tala exists and in the Tala you sing something. That's, that is a, again a bigger, bigger problem. Tala exists only because there is music. There is no construction called Tala if there is no melody or music in it. This by itself is nothing. This is a Tala. Because within the time space, this is about time and space. This is about layering the time and space with articulation, with melody, and what happens in between. So, there is no construction called Tala by itself, onto which we are all creating music and doing something. It comes alive only when there is melody, when there is music. It was, and the question he asked me was because he didn't see it that way. This voice saw it as saying, you put Tala and you sing to the Tala. And I think all teachers say that. Sing to the Tala is what all teachers will say. I heard Mridhaka players say, you know, I have to play to the Mridhaka. I said, what we are singing is a, I mean, play to the Tala, sing to the, play to the Tala. I said, what we are singing is immediate. You know? So, again, there is a problem here in perception. That if I think that the Tala and the music, the Tala and the lyric are inseparable and cannot be deconstructed as being one after another, then I will perceive the idea of music itself very differently. This is a modern problem. Because we think of it as a, some kind of a mathematical construction. We think of a tala as a mathematical construction. So I had to, this is a very interesting experience for me. It just happened a few days, so I had to share it with you. But, you know what is most interesting about how Carnatic music came into being, mainly in the 18th and 19th century, is about three communities. And I have to talk about the three communities. How much time do I have? No problem, perfect. They were the Devadasis, the Nagaswara Vidwans, people in Nagaswara, and the Brahmins. Sorry? And the Brahmins. The Brahmins. These three communities are the reason that you have the idea of Carnatic music. And it was, first of all, I want to say Carnatic music was always elite music. Let's not think Carnatic music at one point of time was shared by every Dalit. No. Carnatic music has always been part of an elitist narrative. It is just something that is true. But the access to it is a different issue, I'll come to that. It's always been part of an elite narrative. The Devadasis were part of that elite narrative, along with the Nagasura Vidwans. See, the Nagasura Vidwans and Devadasis were actually family. Okay? And they were related. Another very important thing is we think of Nagasura people as a caste group. They are not a caste group. They are an art group. Whether it is in Andhra Pradesh or in Karnataka or in Tamil Nadu, this was a community of musicians and dancers. They were not necessarily belong to any caste group. Okay? And in fact, in Tamil Nadu, 
because they were always called the Babar caste. They rechristened themselves as a Vendala. Vendala means cultivator, who actually cultivated the land. He sang his music. The people who cultivate music was a title they gave themselves out of uh, a need for certain dignity of what they did. So they are not a caste group, they are an artistic group. So between the Nagasari artists, the Devadasi and the Brahmins, there was constant interaction of art, which is the most beautiful part. They always shared music, they sang for each other, instruments used in uh, then called Salil was brought into the Carnatic idea of the concept. The scholarship of the Brahmins was given, uh, was taught to the uh, to Nagasari ones. Many people like Muthuswami Dikshita had many students who were Devadasis and part of the Nagasari community. So there was this triangular relationship within which this music was developing. And the aesthetic influences you can see even till today. The idea of the Alapara that you see today is only because of Nagasari. To a large extent, the idea of the Alapara that you hear in South India is a product of what the Nagasura people play in the temple. Compositions like the Varna comes into the concert repertoire because of dance. Then, the word, you know, this, we use the word Pada, Pada and Kirtana. Today, if you say Pada, people think of erotic poetry. If you say Kirtana, they think of Bhakti poetry. This differentiation did not exist. A Pada was also a Kirtana. A Kirtana was also a Pada. There was no differentiation between that being erotic and this being bhakti. This is that happened in late 19th centuries when these separations happened. And a very important part here, which I want to highlight, is though the music was common between the three communities, was their performance common? This is very important. It was not. The music that the Devadasi sang at the Sanctum Sanctum and danced to was very different from the music that was sung in the court, which was very different from the music that the Nagasura Vidwans played during the temple festivals. They all played the Carnatic music, but the three interpretations of the music were different. They were specific to the context in which they were practicing there, but the music was shared. That is so important. So you basically had three parallel, constant ways of looking at one art form in three different contexts. And the three were sharing with each other. Okay? This is very important for us to understand, to understand the problem of modern day concept. <coughs> Since I have little time, I'm going to quickly run by and say, come to what you hear as a concept. Now I told you the three parallel narratives to what a performance or concept was. All that was demolished to one universal idea of what a concept should be, which is what we call a kachi. The specific different interpretation of the art forms between the court musician, in the courts they usually had competitions. So you had musicians fighting with each other. One person sang one raga, the other person sang the other raga. So the stories go, they sang for days and hours and all that. There are many stories like that. Then uh, the same court became the Zalindas bungalow. A similar thing happened. Then you had in the temple stories of Devdasis dancing and singing of Pada for two hours. You had the Narasar with one playing on Alapana for Oh, light. He played Carnatic music. But there were three, there were beautiful things happening. He was within a context, but his music went beyond the context. His, the Pada that, that, that Devdasi danced for from the Sankar Sankar was not just about the religion, the ritual that was being performed, but was also about an artistic interpretation of the form itself. All of this disintegrates with the Devdasis being removed from the narrative because of the anti watch movement. The Nagaswara completely going away with the urbanization of Carnatic music because Nagaswara was then considered only to be some ritual that happened on temple that people just played and the urban Brahmin sanctifying this music as being something pure which means Devadasis cannot be part of it something ritualistic which means the Nagaswara Udwans can't be part of it something Tyagaraja sang who is able to move Brahminism which meant it is ritual it is a practice, it has to have one order, it has to have one system, and it has to be a system that is universal. In this whole narrative, you have deconstructed such beautiful parallel conversations that this music was having in society. You brought it all to what you call the proscenium stage or the sala. And my argument with Carnatic music is that. That is essentially my argument with Carnatic music. 
that what have we lost? And I'm going to give you a few examples of what I think we have lost by singing, because it's far easier for me to do it that way. And to just tell you what is possible. I am not stating here that what I am doing is the only way. I am not. All I am saying is that this constriction, which seems to be universal, is actually not universal because it has completely reduced the idea of the music. And to me, the idea of the music is more precious than the idea of the concert. Another differentiation you could make is that the music and the presentation of the music are not necessarily the same. The presentation is a window into the music, but there is not only one window, there are many windows. And we have to open all those windows. Then we see music in different shades. Example. This is an argument I have thrown out for a long time, and I'm going to bring that in here. It's the idea of lyrics. One of the biggest problems in Carnatic music is lyrics. Everybody will tell you it has to be bhakti. How can it not be bhakti? Tyagaraja had bhakti. If you want to emote a composition, you have to feel the meaning of that word that Tyagaraja has said. If you don't feel that meaning, then how can you? There's no bhava. There's no bhava in the music. I'm going to argue that Tyagaraja himself did not feel that way. I know it's also a ridiculous argument. But I'm going to argue this based on looking at his notations and oral traditions of his compositions. Only on that basis. First of all, when we have to look at composition in the South Indian tradition very different from cinema, where lyrics are written and music is put on it. Okay? The word we use is Vak Geyakara. It's a beautiful word. Vak can be understood as a word. It can also be understood as that which is said. Okay? Geya is to sing. Kara is the person who puts it together. So first of all, a composition is one unified creation of the text, a better word than word, a text, melody, coming together. What happens to word or to language when it is a creation of music is the question that needs to be asked. Here language is not a creation of poetry. It is not poetry that is being tuned. It is a creation of music. There's an example I've, I've used many times, but I'm going to use the same example again. I'm going to use the syllable Ksha. It's a composition of Dikshita. Okay? You will hear Ksha coming again and again. And I'll ask you one question at the end of it. Mm, it's a famous composition. The line is this. Even if you understand Sanskrit, just forget about the fact that you understand it for my sake. Okay? The I want you to hear all the kshas. The Is every kshā the same? Why? It's only kshā. It's after all kshā. Why is every kshā different? The kshā si kshā na the kshā na rasura la kshā na vidhi la kshā na la kshā la kshā na bahu vicha. Yes or no? You felt every ksha. This is a creation of music. Ksha is alive and kicking for every one of us. And you feel it deep inside you. Because every ksha is not the same. Every ksha is different. It's different from its creation. It's actually different from the articulation, which you don't notice. The way I say every ksha is actually different. And I don't say it because I'm not looking at the meaning. Daksha, Sikshana, Daksha, Darasura, that's not. It is the movement of the melodic creation. And I say that the composers themselves knew it. Because in Tyagaraja's compositions, there are many cases I can put forward in front of you where you cannot sing the word as the word. You have to break it. Because it's a melodic creation. It's a creation of music. A classic example 
Everybody who heard, many who heard this.
The first question that comes to my mind, I know you will figure that most of my conversations are based on questions and more questions. And so that will still be the formulation that I follow. The first thing is, who is an artist? What is it to be an artist? Because unless I have some perspective of that, I won't have an idea of what it is that is private, if at all there is anything private, and what is it that is public. And like I said, this whole conversation for me came about from trying to see how I deal with society, how art is part of my life, and how art is part of the public sphere. And where is it that the artist comes in this whole experience? The moment I say artist, it conjures up different images for us of a free thinking person. The words that come is freedom, a certain amount of uh, gay abandon, a certain amount of uh, uh, a joy is the word, not happiness, joy is the word. All these are, are ideas that are associated with the artist and with the art itself. But what is it to be an artist? Who is an artist? can be addressed in many ways. One, at least two ways, one with relation to the art itself, and then is there something about being an artist which is beyond the art. Okay? And so let's first look at the first idea of art and the artist. What is it to be an artist? Anybody? Anybody? What is it to be an artist? Who is an artist? I'm talking about art now, not life, but in art specific. What is it? Music. Music. Anyway, any art, any art. Somebody who is expressive. Somebody who is expressive, okay? Pursues his passion. Sorry? Pursues his passion. Pursues his passion. Somebody who is going to say something here? Art is a way you live. Art is a way you live. Art is a way you live. What do you mean? No, I am talking about art now. As that's why I said, specifically, look, let's look at art and the artist in connection with art itself. Because if you want to take art as a metaphor, then the conversation becomes a little more complicated. So, art and the artist. What is it to be an artist? What is to, to be either a painter or a singer or a dancer? What is it? Rejoicing is representing the inner mind or the consciousness. Sorry? Rejoicing the inner mind. Rejoicing the inner mind, the consciousness. Somebody who is representing. Somebody who is? Representing or imitating. Representing what? Representing or imitating. Representing or imitating. Okay, that's interesting. Can you tell me why you put those two words together? Representing and imitating. I'm just curious. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, just a minute, please. I'm just curious. I think both are related to. So are you putting value for both? In a sense, is it representing, imitating, or imitating, representing? Or the same. You think they're the same? Yeah. Imitation and representation is the same. I think so. Okay? Fine, that's fine. What can be accepted as? Beauty. As beauty. Creator of what can be accepted as beauty. Very interesting answer. Thank you. You are going to say something. We should have interest in a particular subject. Okay? Interest, passion in a particular subject. Somebody also has said that. So craftsmanship, okay, that's another word, very complicated word, craft. Beyond your routine. So, once again. But that can be anything, I'm looking at art, all of you are giving me, uh, giving me things that are, shall we say, life experience types. You know, and that also very vague if I may say so. Because everybody is an artist, I've heard this hundred times. We all say it, nobody knows what we mean. Everybody has a free spirit. One who has a free spirit. I mean, honestly, do we really know what we are talking about? I really don't think we do. Even the artist doesn't know when he says it. That's my honest answer. But let's be, I just want to be a little more specific here. One has a creative mind. Creative mind. Thank you for that word. Very interesting. Everything to get your, you are talking about art itself. Okay? So you are talking about something that is not real and something that becomes real, right? Okay. Or shall we say accessible? Is that better? Okay. Very nice. One, one second. Somebody has to translate. Anybody can translate? 
information and entertainment. Okay, very good. Okay. An additional point for our technology is the aesthetic value of seeing and experiencing the things. What are you thinking? Okay, aesthetic value of seeing and experiencing the things. But that's a struggle of life. That's a struggle every morning. When you get up in the morning, I don't want to get up this morning at 7 o'clock. That's a deep struggle for me. But isn't it? I mean, it is. But getting up at 7 in the morning and doing something is a struggle. So, pushing boundaries in life, I'm not specific is what I'm looking at. Okay, I'm going to throw out two words here. Just to make the conversation go, get the conversation going. Two words that are associated with art. One is imagination, one is creativity. Creative, I think somebody already threw it in. Now, those two words are used together as one another so many times. We say somebody is very imaginative, we say somebody is very creative. We, we kind of jumble the words. So can we deal with these two words in specific with art and see how we can come up with a some kind of an interpretation. Because there's one gentleman who actually did very nicely but put it differently. Yeah. Samajika mm Upayuktate. -hmm. Medium expression of social utility. Well, one kind of art can be that, but not all art. I agree. One kind of art can be what he's saying. Can you translate to him, please? Okay, I come. The, the reason I came to these two words is these two words are very easily associated with an artist. An artist has a lot of imagination, the artist is very creative. No, it's almost as if every artist is endowed with this from some magical land. I, you know, I sometimes wonder where we believe that every artist has this. But is there a distinction between the two? Is what is, uh, makes me very curious. I actually believe imagination is something every individual has. Because we all live in hope. The only reason we all live is because we hope. And how do you hope? Because we imagine. If you didn't hope for tomorrow, if you didn't believe in a tomorrow, if you didn't believe in a better tomorrow, if you didn't believe in your future, there was, there's no inner urge for you to live today. Humanity itself. And the only way we hope is because we all imagine that tomorrow. We all imagine that day we are doing something else that we want to do. The poorest, poorest person is imagining that day that he will be driving a car. That is imagination too. So I somehow feel imagination is not an exclusive property of an artist at all. Never. Imagination is, a, is, 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 a, is almost the reason why humanity lives and can smile every day. Because we imagine we can smile. If we couldn't imagine, we won't be smiling. So, imagination is something that we are all gifted with, for whatever reason, we all have it. But creativity is something slightly different. And the artist does something very interesting. The artist imagines, like every one of us. But brings, like our gentleman actually said it in different words, I'm just, I'm just, shall I say, reinterpreting it, creates a temporal form of that imagination. Creates an accessible form of that imagination. It can be through sound, it can be through visual, it can be through movement, it can be through conversation, it can be through writing. But that which is imagined, that which we all imagine, the artist brings into a temporal form. And what is this temporal form? It is not about making a card, because that is also creating something. The beauty of this temporal form is it deals directly with that which makes us human beings, which is our emotions. The imagination is made into a temporal emotive basket. That is because that's why art makes you feel. That's why art touches you. That is why you can look at a painting for five minutes and not speak a word and walk away. You can read a poem and you feel the same thing. Because it is not about create, making a car or making a, a rocket, but it is about creating a temporal form for the fact that we all feel, which is the magical part of what an artist does. An artist actually gives form to our emotions. And I think that is where the artist does something special. Why I say this, are all art the same? Like the gentleman there asked, said something beautiful because it is connected to what I'm going to say. You have something called classical art, we call something called folk art, we have socio-political art, music, political music, social music, cinema music, 
you are rock and popular music. I mean, at least in musical fields, you have all these different kinds of music. Are all the same? Anybody? Why? That is because you condition. That is not the point. But it all touches your heart. It has to. If it is, if it is an art, it has to touch you. You may not. It may not touch you specifically, but it has to touch humanity in some fashion. Because we are certain things I don't like, certain things you like. Those things are are natural to all of us. But what is different? There is music called classical Shastriya Sangeet, the word we love to use. There is music that we see in cinema. That's both are music. Both are sung. Both are emotional. But they are not the same, right? What is different? That is what I want to explain. But what is different about the form? No, no technical. I am not looking for a technical answer. We don't need a technical answer. But what is different? No, I am going to argue no. I am just arguing for the argument's sake, okay? But, go ahead. No, popular music doesn't make it less, you, you know, the, the tone of what you said. My reaction is that you put cinema music here. And you put classical music here. So I want no hierarchy here. I am discussing this without a hierarchy. I am not passing judgment on film music. But we know it is different. What? Cinema music has form, frame and rules. I can assure you about that. Okay, what do you mean? Can you elaborate that? Um, okay, that is one aspect. But it's possible for me to also listen to cinema music and react to it and listen to Carnatic music and react to it, right? Okay, so let's look at that. I mean, habituation and conditioning is the first layer. So let's peel that out. Let's not look at it because we all can see that that's one layer that needs to be peeled at some point of time. Okay? But let's look at beyond that. You can take cinema music, but not just that. Uh, you can, I can tell you cinema music is a very different dynamic form and it reacts very differently. It has its own way of governing itself. So say it's ruleless would be uh, a very wrong statement to make. But that doesn't make it, that is not the point I'm coming to. I tell you what, I'll give you a simple way of answering cultural, cultural, uh, No, that is all natural. Cultural habituation is natural. I am not passing any cultural, cultural barriers on it or judgment on it. The cinema music exists only because cinema exists. You have a simple answer to this. If there is no cinema, there is no cinema music. Agree? So, the music is visual. Cinema music is visual. Cinema music happens only because there is cinema. And depending on the cinema, the music will change. Depending on the context, the music will change. Depending on the story, the music will change, which means the formal for reformulate itself. Okay? So if I said there's no cinema, I know all of you would probably listen to a cinema album, but I will come to that, I will address that too, before that's a counterpoint that's thrown at me. But the fact of the matter is, the essence of cinema music existing is only because there is something called cinema. Which means there is a visual story. Which means the music should be, if done well, a response, a part, a, an integral part of that story or that narrative that is happening in the movie. You take the movie away, the music has no reason to exist. So the experience of cinema music is part of the experience of cinema itself. Now what happens doesn't mean I can't enjoy cinema music as an album. Of course you can. I am not ever arguing that. But I will argue that if the cinema did happen, you want to listen to the music. I will argue that the cinema's life, that the music's life is integral to the cinema. So that is why, for example, the dance sequence. Now just imagine why, for example, there is movement in cinema music. Why is there a movement? Because they are creating a visual interpretation. It's part of a narrative. It is part of a story. Classical music does not have narrative. It does not have story, as in cinema. Yes, so I, I leave this idea here of saying classical, the word classical I find extremely problematic, but I'm using it so that you understand. Okay? I'm just using it for conceptual understanding. Does not have an external reason for its existence. We'll drop it there. We'll drop this idea there. 
But then there is another problem. The painter in me is not the same. The sculptor in me is not the same. The painter is in seclusion. There is privacy of creation. There is a certain isolation. The whole creative process for the painter is happening only between him or her and the canvas. And it's the canvas and the person. But when I sing, there are all of you sitting in front of me. When I sing, then every one of you watching the creative process actually emerge in front of you. Here itself, the question of private and public becomes very debatable. Is my space, when I sit here and sing for you, a private or a public space? Is the creative process a private or a public space? Is the painter's space in his studio actually a private space? Or is it a public space? You don't see the creation. You only see the canvas when it's all done. But with me, I'm singing in Alapara, it's happening in front of you. Should my space be private? Should it be public? What is that negotiation that happens in an artist? The word used is performing art. Okay. But if you want to use it, you may. What is the private space when music is being created to you? Is there a shift in the understanding of private and public? We have to look at that straight away because there is a huge difference between a painter, a poet and a person singing on stage. Because the creative process is somewhere blurring lines between you and the person. You come to the classical arts, you know, you talk of artists and you say freedom, you say all these things, expression of one's inner self, consciousness, uh, what a universal brotherhood, peace, all these things. You, know? you come to classical music, everything makes up. In the morning, all of you said rules, regulation, fix, structure. It's almost like a counter narrative to what an artist should be, which comes to the word classical. So, you, you know, it's very interesting that the same idea of the artist, when say you say classical artist, you have a different perception. You say it's a painter. In fact, the most free person you will think is a painter. Just naturally think. If I say artist, you will think the most free person, absolutely uh, you know, free person who thinks life is all about love and, and you know, bliss is a painter. But if you think of a classical artist, you will think of some guy who is who's stuck in certain things. These are all images that we have. But what is this little space of mine? I want to talk about that little Carnatic space. And about the public and private in this little Carnatic space that I am part of. What, do, what can I call the private space? Okay, if I was going to talk about private space, I will say the private space is, say, the Guru Shishya. The exchange that happens between a teacher and a student. The learning, the practice, the sadhana or riyas, both beautiful words. Um, that whole engagement with the aesthetic, that whole immersion with my teacher or without my teacher, the 24 7 silent practice that happens in my house when I'm walking on the road, when I don't even notice I'm walking on the road, is part, you could say, part of my private space. I'm just saying, could say. What is the public space? The environment that enables this for me. For example, Chennai. Chennai and Mailapur allows me to listen to a Carnatic concert every day. Allows me to hear the best music. Allows me a December season where I get exposed to so much music. That's part of the environment that I grew in. That's part. My household, my parents, my family. They are also part of that environment. Um, what about the performance itself? Me getting on stage and singing in front of you. The empowerment that I get from that whole thing. The equations that are built. The relationships that are built. The appreciation that I get from all of you. The access that I get to different opportunities. All this is part, you could say, of the public space that an artist occupies. But, I think there is a problem here. I am going to give you maybe one example for this. Can we really separate the private from the public? I will give you one little example for that. I learned from my teacher. Okay? My teacher teaches me certain, I say certain Raga X, whatever the Raga is. Oh, let's add a simple Raga Kamuji. Aesthetic transference happening with me 
the Guru and the Shishya. But can I be certain that the aesthetic interpretation which is being given to me by that teacher is not influenced, not shall we say curated or formulated because of social movements that have removed certain aesthetic interpretations of the music itself. Is that point clear? No. Okay. The point here is I learned something musical from my teacher, but that musical idea is not just a private idea. It has been influenced by practitioners, by performances, by where it is practiced, who practices. Now suppose certain parts of the community stop practicing the music or have less access to the music or are not part of the narrative then are certain ideas of the music also disappearing with them and only ideas that are part of the larger narrative which some communities or people hold being given to me by my teacher so in a way this aesthetic transference is also a public space my teacher is also giving me along with the baggage of the aesthetics a social narrative of who is excluded, who is included, whose voice is heard, who controls the sound of the music itself. This is something we all miss. We think it's purely musical. It is not. And I am not in any way saying the musical part is not important or not beautiful or the form is... I am not commenting on that. But I am saying even my guru may not know. The most amazing thing is my guru himself may not know. That when he is telling me, this is how you must sing these phrases. He is actually telling me, do not sing like this because that is not part of the narrative. Because that used to be sung like X by those people or people who don't matter anymore. So this is this very, very unusual situation. You sit in your classroom, in private space, and you are actually passing a public commentary, a social commentary, and you are going to pass it on to your own student without even realizing that you are. So line between the private and public in a way become very blurry even in that private classroom with a guru and a shishya with neither one of them realizing that they are part of it you know let's look at Carnatic music I'm going to give you a few examples of how in the, in the artistic experience that you all have there is a huge public shall we say narrative that is happening Take a very simple idea of a Carnatic concert stage. Very simple idea of where everybody sits. For those who have not been to a Carnatic concert, I'll just quickly tell you how everybody sits. I sit in the group, I'm the singer. Towards my right, right there is usually the violinist. Sorry, towards my left this side is the violinist. Towards my right is a Pradhan player. Sitting behind here is usually a khajira. If there is a ghatta sitting there, behind me one tanpura or two tanpura players, depending on the artist. This seems like such a simple thing, it seems like a very, very musical arrangement, but it's not a musical arrangement, it's a social arrangement. You know what I'm called? I'm called the main artist. I sit in the middle and I'm called the main artist. You know what they are called? Pakkavadi. This is okay. You know what Gata Gajira are called? They are called Upa Pakkavati. So a word that a lot of Gajira and Gata players today are making a serious effort to stop using. They say do not use that word anymore. Pakkavadhyam is somebody who is next to me who is supporting me. Somebody who supports this person who is supporting me is Upa Pakkavati. Then a lot of things have things happen on stage. One of the very interesting things that happens is the power equations that is constantly happening between me, the main artist, and the people around me. I, I mean, everybody has egos, which is fine. But during the, during the so-called aesthetic experience that all of you go back home with, there is sometimes a lot of things happening on stage. I don't want the violinist to get more applause than me. So I will make sure that the person does not. I will sometimes indicate the time required, how fast they must finish an alapana. There is an unwritten rule that has come. If I sing an alapana for 10 minutes, the violinist should play for 5 minutes. Now this is just something that has come into go. Nobody knows why, nobody knows how. Okay? Basically, it gives me control because I am the main artist. I am, like a friend of mine says, we are the captain of the ship. That's what he calls himself. Then you have the Mridhanam player. The Mridhanam in general, in Carnatic music, is a stronger 
performance component, I'll use the word carefully, performance component than the violin. Because it gives, always, you see a vocalist will always say, I prefer, if I have a good mridhanam, it's okay. If you have a bad violinist, I can manage. But bad mridhanam, I can't manage. So the mridhanam is in a very strong position. So there are power equations happening between us. The ganjira, even worse. The mridhanam player decides when the ganjira should play, should not play. Which can be a purely an aesthetic decision. Yes, agree. But 90% they are not aesthetic decisions. They are decisions of control. So you will find, you, what you don't see is the left hand of the mridhanam player. Where he will say, don't play, play, Stop. It is constantly happening on stage. Right? <laughs> it's constantly happening. And I, it's, it's happened for decades. Okay? Whether it's right or wrong is a different argument. But the fact that it's happening is true. Okay? And the fact is that everybody is negotiating their own spaces within the stage. Everybody is negotiating their power equations on stage. And giving you great music. Okay? Now, where is the public space here? Where is the private space here? I don't know actually. I really don't know where this is because it's, this, all these equations are constantly, negotiations are constantly happening. We are, without telling each other, we are doing a lot of things. We are, we are always trying to, we are also marking territory. I am marking territory. As a vocalist, I am marking territory compared to the violence. The protagonist is marking territory compared to the kind of material. So now, just keep this in mind. Two, issues of women in Karnataka. I do not, it's, it's a known fact that we are a very patriarchal society. Carnatic music is a man's world. First, it's, it's a fact that I'm going to say anywhere and I'm going to argue that also. There are vocalists today, even now, men, who will not allow a woman to accompany. Will not allow women to accompany. Or, even better, will allow women to accompany him until he becomes famous. Once he becomes famous, women are nobles. Okay? Because the worst thing you want is for her to demolish you in the concert. That can't be happening. So, I'm just giving a few examples of these things. Okay, that happens even today, by the way. There are Murdano players in the past and the present who have refused to get on stage if the violinist is a woman. I know of a case where Ghatam lady had to be sent back home from the, from the concert place. Because the Murdhanga player came here and said, I will not get on stage with this woman. This happened now. I'm not talking about 50 years ago, 60 years ago. I'm talking about recent history. This is, and you know, whenever I threw this argument out, the men used to come back to me and say, okay, okay, fine, I agree with you, that we are all chauvinistic. Uh, yes, we are all like this. Can you tell me why women do not want women? It's a very interesting observation. Generally, even the women who close prefer to have men as a companies rather than women. Very fascinating. Yeah, so they also will have women accompanying them till the point of time. It's all. And you know, it's very funny. There's a kind of graduation in this. There will be a sudden one day when this violinist will declare, like a UN resolution, from tomorrow I won't play for women. And this will be said, this is like a major, major announcement. Okay? And all the men will say, ah, now I will call you. There are vocalists who have told violinists, you stop playing for women, I'll call you for more concerts. Whether they actually did or not is a different issue. But these statements are thrown off, even till today. Okay? Now, the woman not wanting women is a very interesting feature. See, control over three men on stage is always better than control over two men by two women. So the woman in the center is actually behaving just like the man. It's a man's world. What she is actually doing is actually she looks as her, as her, at herself as being Male in, in the attitude, the fact is the field is controlled by men, it is men who by men, and, you're, and the women are negotiating in those terms and trying to find places. So, when the woman comes to that position of power, she controls it by controlling only three men. And that gives her incredible amount of power there. So, it's a very interesting negotiation. The women are also doing in this because they don't want to share that power equation with another woman on stage. So, the person who gets really knocked out on this is the woman by this. Because they don't, they don't get anybody to accompany. And it's a serious problem. That's why many of them are becoming vocalists today. One of the reasons many violinists are becoming vocalists is they tell you there's a glass ceiling. You have a point? There's nowhere to go. Okay? Third, of course, the most, most known issue is the issue of caste. All this, by the way, is happening in an art field where divine music is being produced. Okay?
ओके ऑन स्टेज कास्ट इज वेरी नोन कर्नाटिक म्यूजिक इज ग्रामिकल फॉर्म म्यूजिक टूडे इट इज डोमिनेटेड बाय ग्रामिक्स दिस इज नॉट टू से द ग्रामिक्स आर नॉट कंट्रीब्यूटेड टू इट और इन व्हिच इट्स आर आई एम नॉट आई एम गोइंग ऑब्वियसली देयर इज बीन अ ग्रेट अमाउंट ऑफ एनर्जी टू ग्रेट अमाउंट ऑफ वर्क पीपल दैट्स नॉट एन आर्गुमेंट बट द फैक्ट इज देयर इज दिस इनविजिबल कर्टन आई हैव मेट सो मेनी पीपल who just feel intimidated to be in the environment of a Carnatic music concert. And there is there's no point. People always argue me and say, have we said nobody should come to a concert? Have we said we will not teach a non paramic I think that's the most superficial argument for any kind of, uh, shall we say, discrimination. Most discriminations happen in the most subtle and most unsaid, most non-verbal ways. And it's no different in the Carnatic music. My own clan is preferred over any other clan. It's a fact. Okay. It, the fact is that look, I have to accept to myself that I am more comfortable with the Brahmin than I am not comfortable with the non-Brahmin. I know. And the community has to come to that awareness. There is an issue here that we don't have other communities part of this art field. There is a discrimination. It was far more overt in the past, but now it's all subtle. It is all subtle. It is all. I know people who come to a concert and they say we just don't feel there because there is intimidation, and the intimidation may not be even purposely. Purposely, you know, you're not really purposely intimidating somebody, but you own it. The Brahmin owns it. He feels power. I mean, you go come to December in 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 Chennai, and you will see the power oozing out of every one of the person who enters the concert stage. It's incredible. It's fascinating to watch. The show, the broad shoulders, the broad sizes are out, and it's like this is our field. We, you know, and that is itself very intimidating. I mean, they, they, they just celebrate this year in and year out. So these three things are constantly happening. So how are these things affecting idea of art, the private, the aesthetics, the form that you're listening to, the form that transforms you? Of course they are. So it's impossible in many ways. To separate the idea of aesthetics, because it's always being changed, even manipulated by the public sphere within which it is practiced and it's operated. And I gave you a few examples of how it's possible. But then, the free spirit artist. What is the Carnatic musician doing about this? Well, nothing. The Carnatic musician is doing nothing about this because the Carnatic musician is not interested in this in general. Okay, he's not interested in it. Then what does it tell me about his so-called private space, the so-called space of art? What does it tell me? What is happening to his idea of creativity? What is happening to his idea of freedom? Is the artist then? I will ask the question. Truly in touch with art, or is he in touch with a skill and a presentation technique? So, if it's a presentation technique and skill, all I'm doing is reiterating a certain habituated life for you and for myself. So then, I have about 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I'll try to finish. I need to ask the next question: Is is there anything in art? Is there at all anything in art that is much more than this? Is there anything in art that is beyond? Shall we? This is kind of cultural consumption, right? This is cultural consumption. Is there something in art that is truly transporting? That is truly beyond just being cultural consumption? Is there really something? Happening? And the word we use for that, we call it the art experience. And that is something every one of us have had. Every one of us, in our own way, in our own world, have had. So, what is this transcending? When does the context become immaterial? When does the artist come in contact with that transcending art experience? How is it possible? This, to me, as an artist, is the most precious part of this whole conversation. All the sociology, it's fine. That's just my my interpretation of my own life. But this is why an artist exists. This is the why. This is the reason why you find silence in art. And this I will explore a bit. I may overshoot my time for five ten minutes. But pardon me for that. You know, we always talk about music in terms of. Singing, in terms of articulation, in terms of skill, in terms of training, in terms of ability. But the most important thing 
about music is actually listening. It's got nothing to do with singing. It's got nothing to do with skill. It's got nothing to do with you doing something. It's got to do with you actually listening. And I would definitely make a difference, differentiate the word hearing to listening. I think we all know hearing is very different from listening. And here I'm talking about listening. I'll give you an actual practical example for this. This happened in my class when I was teaching my student. So he's lying in the song. Let hypothetically we just take a song. Ramanam Brobara Ramanam Brobara See this is the language of So my student sang it I sang it again Student didn't get it I sang it again Sang it again Sang it again Sang it again Ten minutes have passed And both of us are singing exactly what we are singing But my student is not singing what I sang after about 10 minutes, I think I was just exasperated. I just said, keep quiet, don't sing. And what was actually happening is that by the time I started singing, my student is singing in his head. So who is he listening to? <laughs> me or himself? He was not listening to me at all. He was hearing me and listening to himself. By the time say Rama, he's already singing. We all do this by the way. Every one of us do this in life. We all do this not just in music, we do it when people speak to. We already completed the sentence before the person has completed the sentence. Right? This is the most precious thing that music can give is to tell you to keep your mind quiet and listen. You won't believe the moment I said, stop singing with me. And of course, I use more colorful language because I was very angry. Um, and I, I made the person sing. He sang it next moment. He sang it next moment. Because it, it was not a question of difficulty. It was a simple act of keeping your head quiet and listening. That is the most magical part of being a musician. And a painter will tell you, Painting is not about painting, it's about seeing. Every painter will tell you, sculptor will tell you, painting is about seeing. It's very similar. It's about listening. And what is this listening? Is it about some deep concentration? You know, is it, is it just being completely concentrated? I think there's a step more than concentration. You know, there's a, there's a point when, when the whole idea of listening becomes far, far more subtle. Far, far more non empirical It's abstract. I can hear my every breath. I, every movement slows down. Every note is suddenly up there like this huge, beautiful painting in front of my eyes. And I am moving like a, like a slow motion film. silence, what is possibly coming, is all being listened to by the artist himself. The artist himself is listening, or herself is listening to. There is, I would rather say that there is certain drowning. You are actually drowned. You are drowned in that sound. You are drowned in the movement. You are completely part of that movement. And this is something that happens to everybody. And what happens when you're drunk is the musician herself disappears. I don't hear myself. I only hear, I myself don't hear. We hear. There is heard. It's heard. It's heard. What is heard is being heard by you and by me. And the fact that I am singing suddenly goes away. So there is something that happens in art that transcends all the context that I described. And it happens in public space. Is this private or is this public? Tough one. 
So I don't see myself. I don't see myself or hear myself singing. Almost miraculously, the music is addressing me, you, and every one of us sitting here. The music is addressing you. You know, the most, all of us have done this, the most deep artistic experiences, whether it's a painting or whether it is a musical concert, are times when we walk out and we don't know what to say. We won't say it's beautiful, we know there's something wrong. We don't say it was a lovely evening. We say things like this. We say, I didn't even feel the time go by. We say, it transported me beyond myself. We use the word divine. All these are only expressions of an experience that is we can't articulate in language. And those are the times that the music has actually, or the art has taken you beyond the context of itself. Which makes a very interesting observation that the stage, the audience, have blurred themselves. The whole public space has become each one of your own private space. And you have been as part of that engagement to make it your own private space as the artist herself. So this happens in every, every art experience. Why does this happen? I have, I have a certain articulation of why it happens. I use the word emotional abstraction. You never say out of art experience that I feel sad, I feel happy, I feel joyous, I feel angry. These are not the words. These are actually, when you say you're sad, you're describing a certain end state that you want to define. But what it, it is actually in feeling, you cannot use a word for it. You feel, and then you say, this is sadness. But what you feel does not have a word. Right? This is true of anything. You articulate the state later in correlation with how you are. But the, what you feel you don't. Know. Just imagine if you can have an experience of that state itself. Where you are not articulating it as happiness and sadness. And why do you say sadness? Sadness in context with something else has happened in your life. That's how you wrote sad. You know something is sad because you know that X kind of things are sad. You know Y kind of things are and make you angry. So if you can think of emotion without putting them into the stage, then you don't know how to describe it. That to me is a way of abstracting what you feel and you sense. And the creativity of art is in bringing that essence in the art experience, which is why none of us, in fact, when you all go out of a very deep experience, we get in the car and don't speak. Or you walk without speaking until some stupid person asks you what is there for dinner. Or some ridiculous question that completely snaps everything. And then you're like, jolted back. Till then you don't speak. You don't feel, you actually don't feel sad or happy. You just feel something in your stomach. Something in your chest. You just feel deeply moved. That's probably the best way to put it. And that experience to me is very, very, very important. Because that's why I'm going to ask the last part of this, this session. If an artist is sharing this space with everybody, and I say sharing in, the, in, a, in a slightly different fashion, sharing isn't, I'm not looking at sharing as giving and taking. When you really share, there is no giver and taker. The moment you say I'm giving and you're taking, it's not sharing. The whole hierarchy and the negotiation becomes a power equation, very different, right? So when there is real sharing of art, art happening, and you have shared the space, and the artist is said to be in contact with that, then, if an artist comes in contact with that sense of experience, and is constantly sharing emotion profoundly, how can he or she, how can his space be divided as private or public? What is being shared is, after all, an abstraction of experience, of emotion, of life itself. So how can the outside world not matter? How can you say that the world outside does not matter? Because the artist and every one of us go into the experience where we are experiencing what life itself is without being boxed into conditions of status and situations. The artist is always engaged with life experience. In fact, an artist is switching between, shall we say, the abstracted and the literal. And, the, and this does automatically result in a different view of the literal itself. 
if an artist is in contact or in constant accidental contact, stumbling upon the idea of art as a deeply moving experience, my big question here is how can that not influence the artist's perception of that which is beyond that? How can that not affect, how can that not transfer itself to a world view, to a life view that is far more valuable? But it doesn't happen. That's also true. Because the artist is so full of the dazzle of virtuosity, the, the applause that you give the artist, that brings everything back to the mundane self of where it is. And therefore the artist is trapped in this huge cloud. Artists always have 10 people around them who tell them they are the best in the world. This is 100% true. Okay? I always five people around me after my concert says, there's nobody like me. And I'm very happy to listen to that. But it just, but in spite of this, the funny part is in spite of all this, even that artist stumbles upon the art experience. Even that artist without his or her own awareness suddenly is in this magic. So, my answer to that question that was always asked to me, on why I speak, on why I write, on why I engage in ways other than just singing. If I think what art can give every one of us in the experience that it provides, in, 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 in shall we say, in the, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a precious flower, you know. You just, we're all holding the flower. You, you know, it's so, it's so precious. And we're all in amazement with that. And in that whole sharing, we all come, become very, very, very different people for that, for that few moments. How can that experience not change the way an artist looks at simple things happening outside that sphere? I believe that there is an artistic way of looking at life. I believe that the experience of art, whatever it may be, gives you, makes you in contact with something about yourself that is beyond the habituations, beyond the compartments, beyond the constrictions that the society gives you. And I believe it is imperative that an artist responds to that. And whether it is by language or whether it is by any other fashion, it's important. In the most subtle way, I think art can change people. I'm not talking about the obvious way of social music and political music. I think in opening certain pathways to experiences. If, if just imagine for a moment that you can hold that artistic experience that you have after a concert for say a whole day. Just think of that day. That is a special day. That is an important day. To me, that perspective is what I hope that we all can see in life itself. I am not talk, I'm not using words like spiritual, divine or anything, because I, they make no sense to me. I don't even know what they mean. I don't even know what they mean. But I am talking about something that every one of us do. Every one of us feel. But every one of us think it is only something that should be confined to one evening. We recollect it ten years later and say, ten years before I had that mood. But what did you do with that feeling that came to you? How did that change you? That is what is for me very important. So, the artist in the larger sense is every individual. Artist in the larger sense is every one of us who has an opportunity to experience that. I think art gives us a way to open pathways that we can, it's up to us to keep them open. Unfortunately, we shut them very fast, even artists. Even if they are open, we keep alive the artist. If they are open, we keep them alive, keep alive the artistic moment in us. I think there is this sense, this feeling, this deeply moving experience that we all have. And the moment we start discussing art in such a way, then the self becomes very different. The self is both the personal and the public, with no moving line. In fact, there is no line at all separating the personal from the public. Thank you very much.